Okay. Well, good morning, Mayor de Blasio, Chancellor Farina, and honored guests. My name is Celine Sierra. I am a senior and the student body president for the High School of Arts and Business. I chose the High School for Arts and Business since I wanted a school which had a top academic reputation with teachers who truly cared about the students. When my mother immigrated from Colombia to the United States, by herself, she only had a high school education. She always stressed, about, she always stressed to me how important, important education was. My mother worked very hard day and night as a single parent so I could go to college and have the opportunity that she didn't have. At the High School for Arts and Business, I found my passion for science. Teachers like my physics teacher, Dr. Welt, have inspired me to meet my goals, then exceed my goals. This is a concept that all teachers in, in arts and business have. Besides for the inspirational teachers here at Arts and Business, I received free SAT prep and took free AP courses for college. Arts and Business cares deeply about their students and become ready, college ready, and with the help I received, I know I am ready for future challenges. If I'm struggling or not feeling myself, my teacher, like Ms. Guerrero, is there to lend a helping hand. Here at Arts and Business, our teacher cared deeply about our academics and social success. Every teacher here at Arts and Business encourages all of us to do our very best and that we have potential to be great. I am so grateful to the leaders like Mayor de Blasio and Chancellor Farina who have helped create one of the most ambitious education systems in the world. Next year, I will be going to John Jay College to study forensic psychology, and I could not have done it without the help of my principal, Ms. Zambrano, and the teachers at the High School for Arts and Business. I have a deep love for New York City, which is certainly the best city in the nation. I am very proud to be part of a school that feels like a second home. I have made my mother very proud of me, and I will always try my hardest to make my teachers, school, and the New York City be proud of me as well. It is my honor to introduce to you the mayor of New York City, Mayor de Blasio. Well, Celine, we are proud of you. you. Not just your mother's proud of you. We're all proud of you. you. Congratulations. Let's give her a round of applause. I respect anyone who has run for office, and Celine, as student body president, traveled the same path. And thank you for helping to lead the young people of this school. Uh, what an extraordinary place this is. What a good news story this is to spend time. We just spent time with a group of students you see behind us. I want to thank all of them for the time they spent with us. And if you want to believe in the next generation, come speak to these students here at the High School for Arts and Business. If you want to see what's possible in a New York City public school, come here. Because this is a school that's doing things right, that is tapping into the best energies of our young people, that has an environment that's working for everyone. And it was wonderful talking to the students about what they liked about this place. And the words that we heard it felt like a family, felt like a home, that they believed everyone was working to help them move forward, that everyone was supporting each other. Uh, when they talked about teachers giving their own time on weekends for tutoring, this is what we aspire to, a school that is working for everyone and uplifting our young people. But it's also great to see these powerful examples of the next generation of New Yorkers. So I'm so happy to be here today. And we have good news to talk about, but there's nothing better than seeing the young people who are part of that great news, who are part of the changes that are happening now in our schools. So until June, I was a New York City public school parent, and I was a parent of a high school student. I can tell you that for Sherlane and I, the, the years we put into bringing up Chiara and Dante was everything to us. They were the center of our world. We put in everything we had. I bet the parents of these great young people could tell you their stories, too, about all they tried to give to their children so they'd succeed in school. My life has changed now. My kids have graduated. They're both in college. But now, I have 1.1 million kids to shepherd on the way to graduation. Chancellor Farina has 1.1 million kids to help along the way, and we think about them every day. We think about what it's going to take 
to give each of them the opportunity they deserve. And we're very proud to say that more of our children than ever are on the right path. And now we have the facts and the numbers to prove it. We just got the report on graduation rates, and for the first time in our city's history, more than 70% of our students graduated in four years from our high schools. That's something to be very proud of. 70.5% to be exact, and that is a two-point gain over last year and a 4.4% gain over the last two years since I've been in office and this team has been in office. First time we've ever broken that 70% goal. And it's a reminder of everything that's possible. You go back a few years ago, that would have been considered impossible in this city. But we know not only can we break 70%, we have set our goal on 80%. And we're going to do everything we can to get this school system, get our kids to that point where 80% are graduating within four years. And by the way, a reminder, with the toughest standards in the entire nation. In New York City and New York State, we have the highest academic standards in the nation because we recognize what today's world requires. We recognize what it means to be ready to go to college and career in today's environment. We want all these young people to succeed. We want their families that they build to succeed. They need a higher level of education <clears throat> than the one that I was expected to have when I was a kid. So we brought those standards up while increasing the graduation rate at the same time. Now this school, this school is an example of what's possible. And it is well ahead of the city average and it's a reminder to us to keep striving for more and more. Here at Arts and Business, graduation rate is now up to 90.4%. And the information we have now that just came out for the first time this school topped 90%. So this improvement is happening all over the city. Some schools that are already great are getting even better. Some schools that have had tough time are finally beginning to break through. We know at the same time as we celebrate the higher graduation rate, there's more that we have to do to reach those who are still not graduating. Now look, dropout rate is also down, and this is important. The dropout rate signifies those who leave and don't come back. I'm going to put it as bluntly as I can. They leave the schools during those four years of high school and they never return. That has gone down again. It's 9% now, and that's too many. But we saw a decrease of 0.7% from the previous year, so we see that we're chipping away and chipping away and getting more and more kids to stick with their education. To give you a little perspective, 9% of our kids in the last year left and didn't come back. Just a decade ago, 2005, 22% of our kids dropped out in those four years and didn't come back. So that is a striking example of the progress this city has made. It is happening across the board. We know there are opportunity gaps in this city and this country. We know there are disparities. We talk about them openly. We attack them forthrightly. But we can also say that the progress we're seeing on graduation is across every demographic. That progress is being made by Latino students, black students, Asian students, white students across the board. And fewer are dropping out across the board. College readiness is up. Now, we have a lot more to do on college readiness. When I offered our equity and excellence plan, I said we have two missions, to get the graduation rate up and to get the college readiness levels up. We intend to do both, but we're happy to see progress on this front as well. That 80% graduation rate over the next 10 years is now even more reachable because we've proven yet again we could make real progress. It's a number that New York City, again, would have been inconceivable in the past 
New York City has never gotten close to an 80 percent graduation rate. But it's what one of the greatest cities in the world should achieve. So this is both an aspiration to motivate us and energize us, but it's also a reminder of what we're supposed to be. We can't claim to be one of the greatest cities on the earth if we can't reach that level. I know that the efforts we're putting in place through equity and excellence are going to help us reach not only a higher graduation rate, but also reach more and more of those young people who leave and don't come back. I don't want to see a single child leave our schools and not come back. Some kids may need to go into a fifth year or even a sixth year before they graduate. But I want them to graduate. And we want to be with them every step of the way. That's why we've put a whole series of changes in place that are going to change the entire experience for our young people. And I want to emphasize this. We weren't approaching things the right way. We just weren't because we didn't start with early childhood education. And you'll hear from Kathy Nolan in a moment, but she's been fighting this fight for years to start at the beginning. If you're going to get it right for all of our kids, they all deserve to start equally with high quality early childhood education. We call that pre-K. <coughs> what an amazing moment uh, a couple of nights ago when the President of the United States said, pre-K for all should be a national goal. I can't tell you how powerful it was to hear that come from the leader of the free world, that this nation should be committed to pre-K for every single one of our, of our young people everywhere. So we've done that crucial piece. We need to get our second graders and third graders to reading level. Over these next 10 years, that's going to be a supreme priority for us. Because again, how do we lose young people later? Because they don't have the skills early enough to believe in themselves and to show that they can succeed. That's a key part of equity and excellence. Algebra for all at middle school level. AP courses for all in every high school, regardless of what that high school has gone through in the past, every high school now will have AP courses. Computer science for all in every grade. These are the things that actually transform a school system Bring it into the modern world, make it possible to reach an 80% graduation rate, make it possible to pull more and more of our young people back and to make sure they don't drop out and they stick with it and we stick with them. That's what we aspire to do. Quick couple of quick sentences en español. Nuestra ciudad sigue siendo líder en la educación. Por primera vez, más de 70% de los estudiantes de secundaria se gradúan. Ha caído el nivel de deserción escolar y más estudiantes están listos para la universidad. Más estudiantes latinos y afroamericanos en nuestras escuelas se están graduando y menos abandonan la escuela. La mejora en las tasas de graduación significa más oportunidades, mejor, mejores futuros para nuestros niños y una mejor ciudad para todos. With that, I want to bring forward a woman who gets a big share of the credit for the progress we're making. And she may have 1.1 million kids to look out for and take care of. But she treats all of them like family, and that's part of why she's a great chancellor. Carmen Farina. Thank you. Um, a special thank you to Principal Sombrano, Anna, uh, who I meet over and over again, and I finally get to come to this wonderful school, and her administrative team. It takes more than one person to make these kinds of things happen, and I know her team has been specifically selected to bring out the best um, in every student in this building. And if you could hear these students talk, one of the things that they have said universally is how much they're helped individually as well as collectively. And I think all our high schools have to take this mission on in a very special way. So I think that seeing the gains in education I think is wonderful, but also seeing the high investment that our teachers and administrators are putting 
into their work to show that they really care about the kids is really also equally important. I want to stress um, not only about the graduation, but the dropout rate being lessened. And I think one of the things about that is that we really have emphasized that our high schools in particular, but certainly pre-K and up, need to make not only the school day, but the after school day a very active, engaging place. All the students here spoke about the extra time the teachers spend with them outside of the classroom, that they can come to Saturday classes, that they can ask for specific directed help. And I met with two parents who, ah, there is one of them, um, who said to me that this is a school for her as well as her student. Here's where she learned English and where she could come to class, ¿verdad? Aquí es donde aprendiste inglés. And that this for her is an extension of her own home. Schools need to be community hubs. Schools need to be part of that. One of the stories, three of our students who are standing behind here have already gotten their college acceptance. That's really pretty special. Um, and one of them has already gotten a substantial scholarship from one of our law firms in New York City. And boy, would I like to see more firms step up and give up and give us college scholarships for students who are going to pursue think, um, subjects in the area that they need. So if you need a lawyer, law firms step up and give us some more scholarships. Mm -hmm. okay? This is a, um, right, yeah. I, I think also this is a school that has now formed an alumni group where alum from this school come every single Thursday to work with the students to insist not only that they get into college, but once they're there, they continue for another four years. So this is sort of the things that we're looking to do in all our schools to move forward so that we can honor the teachers, the principals, but most importantly, the students who have great futures. Everyone, with one exception of these students, comes from a home where English was not the first language. That really says also our kids are capable. And the principal also, and many of her staff members, are not English speakers originally, but came to this country, in the principal's case from Argentina, to get a better life. And what could ask for better role models than administrators who have walked the walk and talked the talk? So it's a pleasure to be here today and to say congratulations to the entire school. And also to say, I hope to be here next year and say the same thing, that all our high schools are in the same trajectory. So thank you. En español. Right? Yeah, I was going to say not just the principal who grew up in a household where right. English was not the first language. It was the chancellor who grew up in a household where English was not the first language. Absolutely. And when I mean, one of the things that I think we really want to make sure, we're going to have a college awareness day starting January 27th citywide, because in my family, my parents never went beyond third grade. Either for any, they were in Spain during the Spanish Civil War. We won't go into all the politics, but the reality is that that cannot be what limits any of our kids today. And we've got to make this important. So College Awareness Day is going to be talk about college in all our schools, all on the same day. In español, um, para los padres hispanos, yo creo que es muy importante que reconozcan que en todas las escuelas hoy esperamos que todos los estudiantes vayan al colegio avanzado. Y no debe de ser las familias donde todos hablan inglés en casa, donde los padres fueron al colegio. Es para todos los estudiantes en todas las escuelas. Y los padres tienen que insistir en sus escuelas también que los profesores, como los profesores en esta escuela, tengan oportunidades para trabajar con sus estudiantes, ayudarles a llenar los papeles para el colegio, para cogerles um, dinero que necesitan. Nadie debe no ir al colegio, a college, porque no tiene dinero. El dinero no debe de ser la razón. Todos tenemos las oportunidades cuando vamos a las escuelas y hacemos los esfuerzos que tenemos que hacer. Money should not be the determining factor whether you go to college or not, because all of us now have, in this particular school, every student here said that they got financial aid assistance, they got help in how to fill out the college applications. That's our wish for the future. Thank you. Well, um, success has many fathers and mothers, but success here has one mother in particular, and the principal really deserves tremendous credit for what she's done as the leader of this school over the last eight years and such a positive spirit that she's brought and obviously energizing her team and her students to great achievement. Principal Anna Zambrano. Step up. Step up. There you go. My name is Ana Zambrano Burakov. In Argentina, we hyphenate our husband's names. 
My father's last name was Sambrano. And I learned a lot from him. Today's speech is a little bit about how is it that a community like ours can succeed. I believe that it's a combination of the support from the families and the school working as one team. We have to actually be in one team in order to succeed. And that doesn't happen unless you have your guidance team, your attendance team, your teacher teams that are looking at every single child. What happens when you see that the attendance drop for that child that usually comes to school? That cannot be ignored. That's something that you have to discuss in a team and meet with a kid and figure out what are the social and emotional challenges that this child is having and handle that first. Then when you get them back to school and that has been settled, instruction can take place. I, the proud principal of the school, happen to have the best teachers in the world. And I know that Farina has excellent teachers all over, but every principal says this, right? <laughs> now that's part of my, uh, I like you. Okay. I, I do. I, I actually feel that the teachers and the support staff here in the building, and by support staff, I mean everyone. I mean the school safety that welcomes the kids. I mean the cafeteria staff who make sure that we have nutritious lunch and looks out who's depressed or not that day and tells us, right, Giovanna? It's a community. It's a community of effort that makes it happen. It's something that happens as a result of people loving what they do and putting passion every day together with hard work. And, and that is something that definitely happens here and many other places. The graduation rate, 90%, happens as a result of us giving all children a chance to take advanced placement courses, college reading courses. We do not care what their average is coming in. We rank kids based on attendance so they can come. We don't care if students bring a portfolio. We actually don't want to see art portfolios. We just want to know that they have a passion for learning the arts. And if you have the passion, we will show you. If you want to be a public speaker, we will show you. If you want to take business, we will show you. We're not afraid of a child wanting to learn, but the opportunities will be here. So everyone has full potential in our school. But my father, just like all your fathers and mothers, right, have an impact on who you are. And my father used to tell me, if you get a small tree and you see it all week, but you put it in the right soil and you give it the proper care, that tree will grow and will give you the fruit that you expected. I believe that the High School for Arts and Business treats every student with that love and that passion that will get them to give the highest potential that they can give. And I believe that all students with the right support can actually achieve maximum potential. We have a long way to go. If you study our data, you're going to see that attendance has gone up every year. You have also seen that academics in general have gone up, graduation rate has moved up, and we're proud of that. We still have a long way to go. We want to continue doing great things at Arts and Business. So I am going to continue working with this fabulous team and using our passion and hard work to continue making changes here in Corona, Queens. And hopefully, we will also be able to produce wonderful leaders like we have here today. So with that, I want to thank everyone here. And thank you for the honor of coming to the High School for Arts and Business. This means a lot for my families, for my students, and for my staff. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to compare Anna to uh, someone I met yesterday. Well, I met him before, but I was happy to see him yesterday. Terry Collins, the manager of the New York Mets, yeah. who, yeah, you can clap for that. <laughs> We're in Queens. I know. I know where we are, Michael. Uh, but I met, watch the analogy. So Terry Collins got his team to the World Series, and we celebrate that. But he still has a ways to go because he wants to win the World Series. Anna has her students graduating at 90 plus percent, but she comes here and says, but I want to go farther. So I wish Anna success on the way to 100 percent and Terry Collins success winning the World Series. So wrap it all together. Uh, Anna spoke about the passion when you get a team to believe in something. We want to see that in every school. We're working every day towards that kind of sense of a team unit in every school. A partner in that work all over the city is the president of the UFT, Michael Mulgrew. Uh, hi, 
Hi, everybody. So today actually is a celebration. Uh, first, congratulations to all the parents. They have, we now have a 70% graduation rate, and we still have more to go. To the teachers, the guidance counselors, the secretaries, all the therapists, look what we have done. They have said that we can't do these things. Have we accomplished it? Yes. So congratulations yes. to you. Thank you for all the hard work. I want to put this in perspective. New York City is the largest school system in the country by far. It is the most diverse, and it also has the greatest challenges of any school district. And people have, and we've heard all sorts of different things about education over the years. And it has always been the educators that have said, if you give us the tools and support and allow us to engage students in a meaningful way, then we will have much better outcomes. And we're standing here in a school that has completely embraced that philosophy. It wasn't just about their test scores. It was about how do we make sure they're coming to school. And when they're here, how do we keep them interested and engaged in their own well-being, which is their education? And they have embraced that completely. So to Principal Zambrano and your staff, again, thank you. You take it and you show what happens when educators and parents working together for what is best can get great results. Now, we still have a long way to go. We have more to do. But I am so proud that we are doing this here in New York City. The children behind us, you had to hear their stories today. They all, what was the best thing you liked about your school? They like coming to school. And why? Because they feel that it is important. Right? Did you say that? <laughs> what else did you say? We like our teachers. We feel like we're engaged. We feel like we're important in what we're doing. And, ma and it matters. That's the key to education. You always hear all this, and I'll say it nicely, silliness. That was a really good Yes, idea. that's really a politically good correct way. There's a whole bunch of silliness. But in the, in the end, it comes down to building the relationships at the school level and making sure that the people working with the students have the ability to engage them and not just telling them, do this or else. So to the parents, again, congratulations. To the mayor and the chancellor, thank you. Thank you for embracing that for this school. I know it wasn't easy when you started to have that philosophy, but you knew it would make a difference. And to me, to all of the members of the UFT, congratulations. You have made us all proud once again, and we now have a 70% graduation rate, and we're just going up. So thank you all very much. Uh, so much of what we are doing to change our schools has required support from Albany. And uh, sometimes the assumption was that that support would be impossible. I remind you all of what we went through in the fight for full day pre-K for every one of our children. But we had a champion who really knew how to get things done and was tireless and focused. And one of the reasons we have full day pre-K for every child in the city because of the work of the chair of the Assembly Education Committee, Assembly Member Kathy Nolan. Very kind of you. Thank you. It was very kind of the mayor, and I thank you for those kind words. But it's really a pleasure for me to be here today to celebrate this wonderful milestone and achievement for New York City's public schools. I do want to say, uh, you know, having been involved in the uh, school system for a very long time, uh, my first political activity was in 19, 40 years ago when I was at Grover Cleveland, and they had 6,000 people crammed in a building for about 2,000. And, you know, in the and that really ignited my political activism. So in the course of a long career in New York City, I've seen a lot of things come and go. And I've been a supporter of mayoral control for the New York City school system for a long time, and I intend to continue to support uh, the effort to renew mayoral control uh, uh, in Albany for the mayor for as long as we can push it forward. Um, and one of the reasons for that is that I've embraced all the changes that have come, but I'm particularly happy in the last two years to embrace the concern and the support that Mayor de Blasio has given the New York City public school system, both in his support for pre-K, but in his selection of the amazing and the wonderful Carmen Freenia as chancellor of the New York City school system. And, you know, I don't say it to her enough. I always say she forgot more about education than most of us know, but her intense dedication 
her commitment and the, her vast store of knowledge has really been the difference in taking some of the changes and making them work so that we have things like the AP initiative in every high school. Um, it's been a pleasure to be here today. I know Principal Zambrano from her days at Grover Cleveland when I was a student. She was not there when I was a student. She's very young. But um, Cleveland had a long tradition of uh, nurturing foreign language teachers as well, if you remember. Unfortunately for me, I took many years of Spanish from a, per, a teacher I think you know. That's right. But I don't have bilingual brains. I never could quite. I talk English too fast. But uh, it, she was a marvelous. Uh, she was a marvelous leader at Grover Cleveland, and uh, she's been a marvelous leader. And when you see that, when you see Chancellor Farina mentoring a young teacher who becomes an AP, who becomes a principal, and you see that kind of commitment to a person's career path, that's the kind of level of detail I'm talking about when we talk about Chancellor Farina. So uh, it's on every level. And so I want to thank Mayor De Blasio for selecting her. I want to continue to pledge my support, as I know so many of my colleagues will do, in ensuring adequate funding for the New York City schools, moving forward on the CFE settlement issues, once again, pushing for a larger sum of money, uh, working certainly with our partners in labor at all levels. I know from all the uh, uh, various uh, people who work, whether it's in school safety or the, uh, the lunchroom, in pushing forward to make sure our city has what we need for equity and excellence. And I want to congratulate Mayor de Blasio today for all his good work in so doing. Thank you. You gave you height. And now more height again. We want to thank Senator Toby Ann Stavisky for also being there for us every step away in the, of, the, of the way in the Senate and for being a real champion, former teacher herself, and a believer in what the school system can do for all our kids. Senator Stavisky. I almost fell off that. You wouldn't want that. Yeah, happen. I don't want to fall off. <laughs> As the mayor said, I'm a former high school teacher. And I've always said, when I walk into a school, I know what a good school looks like. You, you get it right away. And the minute I walked into this school, and I met the principal and the staff, I said, this is a great school. And it's a school where I wish I had done my teaching. Uh, let me mention one other, or pick up on something that the mayor said, and that is the question of college readiness. Uh, I'm the ranking member on the Senate Committee on Higher Education, and I, at one time, did chair the, the Higher Ed Committee. And one of the questions that I always ask both the chancellor, the chancellor of both SUNY and CUNY, is what is happening to your remediation rates? It, Students, as you know, uh, who do not meet the standards of SUNY or CUNY have to attend special classes at the community colleges. The rate at CUNY is somewhere around 78% of the incoming students need remediation in either math or English. And the chancellor of SUNY said that the numbers are very comparable. The taxpayers are the ones who are suffering, aside from the students, because they're paying for the education twice. Mm -hmm. They're paying for aid to education, and they're paying again when the children or their, their children attend SUNY and CUNY. And I think this issue is ex extremely significant because I think it's going to change. And the change will result from Kathy Nolan and other people my, including myself, supporting universal pre-K. I think that's going to help. And I think schools like this, where a child, the assumption is that a child can learn, and every child can learn. And I think what will happen in the future is that the rate, the need for remediation will decline, and I think our schools are really headed finally in the right direction. So I congratulate everybody and uh, uh, let us hope that we come together at other schools like this. Thank you. Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Toby makes a very powerful point. Another status quo that was accepted for way too long, that our young people could actually leave schools unprepared to such a degree that they needed a whole nother round of remediation when they got to CUNY or SUNY. This should have been intolerable. It should have been addressed years and decades ago. It couldn't be addressed if we didn't do early childhood education right. It couldn't be addressed if we don't get our kids to a reading on grade level by third grade. 
We're trying to now level with the people of this city about what it actually takes to turn around the school system, truly attain the kind of graduation levels that we need, the kind of college readiness we, lead, we need, and to sustain it. But today is an indication of what can be when the pieces are brought together properly. So we're going to take uh, questions on this announcement and on education. And uh, then I want to say a couple other things uh, and take some additional off-topic questions as well. So let's start with this announcement today. Yes. You mentioned it earlier referring to the Mets. And I guess the Mets, like the Department of Education, is limited in how well it can do with its spending and how much money it has. Very nice analogy. <laughs> Very nice. More about what you and the city intend to do to get the money that is owed to us from Albany, and, and as um, as Kathy Nolan invoked, you know Albany now for most of a decade has not uh, made good on the obligation to the city, which was determined by the highest court in this state. The Court of Appeals a decade ago said that there needed to be a different formula, and the city of New York deserved more. So we have fought that fight already. We will fight it again. It's something we're obligated uh, to keep fighting until the day there's real change. Uh, some of the things that you know, could provide the biggest, fastest changes could happen if those resources were there. So uh, that's going to be, once again, uh, a fight in Albany. I know these two leaders in Albany will be there for it, and a lot of others as well. Yes. State education policy is looking quite different this year, this session, compared to last. Yes. The governor has seemed to evolve um, on Common Core, on teacher evaluations, new emphasis on community schools, perhaps slightly less emphasis on charters. I'm wondering what you make of this switch, um, whether you think your administration or the city had any influence there, and what it will mean for city education policy you know, during the budget season. Um, I think some of the things we're doing here are working, and I hope that contributed because the focus on um, actually doing what needs to be done to educate children, which starts with early childhood education. There's just no two ways about that. That, that being left out of the equation for so long uh, meant the education debate was not serious. So I think pulling the entire discussion back towards what works, the devotion to reaching our children, especially at getting them to grade level by second and third grade, I think that has contributed to a different kind of discussion. I also think the fact that in this city, we embrace Common Core, but we believe fundamentally in giving our teachers what they need to be able to work with Common Core. And that was a big problem around the state. I think a um, contradiction was created from the beginning, that higher standards were needed for the modern world, but teachers were not given the training and the support and the kind of realistic timeline to apply those new standards, which created tremendous frustration for students and parents. So uh, this is something that goes back years now and, again, begins with federal policy. Let's be clear. This is all no child left behind and, and other things that create a lot of dominoes falling. But I think what, what we've done here is to say we're going to embrace higher standards the right way. Uh, and bring everyone along and support everyone in the process. I think that's been a helpful example. Um, and look, in the end, our belief, we want to work with every kind of child, and every kind of parent, every kind of school, including uh, religious schools, including charter schools. But I think the central viewpoint of this administration is about 94% of our uh, kids uh, are being educated in our traditional public schools versus our charters. That's where we have to make the biggest changes. That's where the most attention and focus is needed. And by showing that when you actually put in the attention and focus, you can move the graduation rate, you can move the test scores, you can have a lot more success stories, I think that does affect the debate. But I think there are many other things that contribute all over the state. But I hope you know, some of the examples here were helpful. Yes. You mentioned that all different um, groups of students made progress this year in terms of graduation rates, but that there are still big gaps. Yep. And some people would say that one way to address that is by having more diversity within schools so students are learning alongside each other. And this school, I think, is an example that has a high graduation rate, but it's also diverse demographically in, in terms of the academics of the kids who come into the school. So do you have any plans to increase the diversity at high schools across the city? So a couple of points. So, you know, 
question has come up a lot, and I'm glad it, it has, because it kind of gets to some of the root societal reality we have to deal with. I think our, at the very beginning of the equation, our affordable housing plan is going to lead to opportunities for people to get housing all over the city that will bring with it some implicit uh, diversification. Uh, but I remind you, at middle school and high school level, with school choice, there's lots of opportunities for young people to go to any number of schools, any number of communities, and be together. Where we have a problem, and I've been pretty blunt about it, is with some of our specialized schools that are unrepresentative. And we're working in the ones that we have the ability to determine the policies for admission. We're working on reforms. We're going to be working with our state partners on reforms and some of the others. But that's an example of a situation where there's a lack of diversity that can be addressed and should be addressed. But uh, I think it's one of the pieces to the equation, and, and a lot of the other things we've talked about today, we've got to do all of those things if we want a long-term better result. On this topic, on the announcement or anything else, education, yes? Uh, earlier this week about a woman in Flushing who allegedly was holding two students captive uh, in her home. Yep. And uh, it turns out she was also arrested in May for child abuse. And I understand that this is a state issue, but uh, the concern, and I guess the question is, how does the city and, and the schools generally get involved when there's someone who, there's a temporary order of protection issued against her, she still has yeah. custody of the children in her home, they're staying with her and a host family. How does the city, uh, how yeah. does the city get involved in that? I'm going to start and then both of you come over. The Hold on, let me. She's passionate. Let me say, the school, the school helped to the principal. Come on over. The school helped to solve the problem. They'll tell you the details, but at the same time, it's a very good question of, and I think we're we're certainly looking at everything from the school angle. But if was there along the way some place, whether the state, the city, anyone could have found that problem earlier? But I'm very very proud of the principal who intervened when they did, and they said talk about it. Right. Toby, I think, needs okay. to go first. Well, no, it's okay. happened in my district. Uh, I represent not only Flushing, but it occurred at Francis Lewis High School. And it was an assistant principal who noticed some bruising on the children and did something about it. It's not just knowing there's a problem. It's doing something. You can recognize, I know there's a problem in Albany in so many areas. It's the idea of action and corrective action and I commend the prince the assistant principal who noticed this and that's how it all came uh, to light and, and the only thing I want to add to that is that we have done a lot more training in the last two years and we've increased the number of guidance counselors but also we want people to report what they find and we have encouraged them to do so because sometimes when you see something, it's very easy to look the other way. Mm -hmm. I mean, the first thing after I read it on the newspapers is I sent letters to all three. There were three people directly involved. I want administrators and teachers to know this is part of your job. This is what you do, and the people who do it, thank you so much. Amen. Yes. There's a school in Coney Island, I believe, uh, PS329, where a mother's claiming that her daughter, a fourth grader, was abused by a teacher, apparently uh, kicked on the face. Do you have any information about that incident? You know, in cases like that, they're under review, and when we have information, we'll be happy to share it. Okay, in español. Uh, cuando tenemos uh, casos como eso, primero tenemos que hacer una investigación, y una vez que la investigación esté terminada, después damos los resultados. Okay, last, yes. Um, the, uh, Mr. Mayor, the head of the principal's union expressed a lot of concern about the way the renewal program was being run and um, specifically expressed concern that there was not enough autonomy for principals. They couldn't choose the uh, CBOs that they're allowed to partner with. Um, just want to see whether you can address kind of his broad concerns and maybe if, if Chancellor Farina can express sure. the specific one. Uh, I've known Ernie Logan many, many years, worked with him closely. We've worked very closely together these last two years and all the changes we're describing. I was very surprised to hear him say something I hadn't heard him say before, and he certainly has my phone number. Uh, so I, I will uh, try and ascertain where this new concern is coming from. But the bottom line is um, we've done a lot to support the entire school community. Uh, we've done a lot to support our principals and administrators. And we do have a different model. 
If anyone uh, says they preferred the previous administration's model, well, they should have voted for that. Uh, we had a different vision. And it was a student-centric vision. It was a school community vision. It was not treating schools like corporations, but treating them as a community center that helps all our children. And uh, I do believe that that works only through mayoral control of education, and mayoral control works through having a strong chancellor like Chancellor Farina, and that we have to create consistency in our approach across all schools. So if the previous administration had a different vision of the role of uh, principals or networks, that's great. We had an election. You might want to go back and check the details of that election and the dialogue that occurred. We're implementing exactly the vision that we said needed to be implemented. I don't think that's really a surprise to Ernie Logan. Chancellor, what do you have to say? <laughs> um, first of all, there's always going to be opportunities to agree to disagree. And I anticipate that we are going to be working cooperatively in the future. Um, I respect principals tremendously. I was one of them. But I also believe when schools are in trouble that autonomy has to be earned. It's not automatically given. And we went very clearly into the renewal work saying there were certain things that we were going to hold people's feet to the fire on. And one of the what, things was that professional development was going to be a priority. We were going to investigate what we thought was the best kind of professional development. And I will tell you, many, many of the renewal school principals have called me since then and say we're happy. So I would encourage you to in interview some of those people. Um, but the other piece is that as far as the community schools, there was an RFP process put out. Principals got to interview CBOs and choose their CBOs, but the CBO had to fit with the needs of the school. So if a school wanted to do more of this versus that, I'm thinking of a particular renewal school that chose two different CBOs, one to do the academics during the day and one to do uh, more of the social emotional needs. So I believe that we will go forward and that we will continue to work hard, but I want to stress that if everything was going beautifully, we wouldn't have had to go into this process. And now we need to, renewal means that we need to renew these schools. I found something that needed fixing. This is the way we're going to fix it. And the reality is that a vast majority of principals in the renewal world are extremely happy with the work we're doing with them. Thank you. Well, one other point. Thank you. One other point. This chancellor was so devoted to fixing these schools that had been in many ways ignored and uh, left without what they needed that she made a series of changes. Uh, she made sure the best staff possible was in each school this last year. We went out of our way to ensure that great teachers who were in those schools stayed, that additional great teachers came in, including master and model teachers under that new program we initiated to uh, reward teachers who were so successful that they could coach others. Uh, we obviously went out of our way to add uh, after school programs, tutoring, a whole host of things to strengthen the schools. We also changed 35 of the principals in those 94 schools. Very important fact. And there are great, great principals like Ms. Zambrano, and there are other principals that we didn't see as having what it took to turn around those schools. So 35 of them were changed so we could get the kind of leadership we needed for a turnaround. And we'll very much consistently do what these schools need to keep turning around. On this topic, still anything education? So yep. kind of, if we could just get the Chancellor's reaction to um, I guess it's PS12 on Woodside. Um, there's a norovirus problem that they have there. You can get my reaction. Yeah, <laughs> what you're doing is make sure that it doesn't spread to other schools. Yeah, no, I, I was informed of the situation at PS12 this morning. I've ordered the school be disinfected today and again over the weekend. So we'll take two passes at it. We think it's the norovirus, which is fairly typical in winter, but obviously it's had a very bad effect on that school community and on the kids there. So the school will be disinfected today, will be disinfected again on the weekend. Our message to any uh, students and staff who are not feeling well, they should stay home. Uh, we we want to help them get better and we want to get a handle on this. Department of Health is on site right now monitoring uh, the disinfection and the ongoing effort to get that school back and ready for Monday. That school is not closed. It can operate, but again, the disinfection will happen twice between now and Monday. Anything else related to education? Going once, twice. Let me say something up front, and then we'll take any questions. 
Uh, I gave a press conference yesterday in Albany to talk about um, a number of things in the governor's uh, state of the state address that I think were positive and favorable to the city. Uh, today I want to indicate, now that we've had a chance to study the budget documents carefully, there are two items in the budget that are not fair to New York City, that will be harmful to New York City, that will set us back, and will particularly set back our students at CUNY, uh, and will set back the people of the city in terms of health care, because it will take away very substantial Medicaid resources from this city. And on that second one, it's important to recognize that that Medicaid cut would only be uh, a beginning uh, in the upcoming fiscal year. It actually gets much worse with each passing year. Our initial estimate, and this is initial, is that by fiscal 2020, that cut would exceed a billion dollars a year to New York City. So my simple statement today is we will fight these cuts. We will ask the assistance of both houses of the legislature in fighting these cuts. Uh, they are unprecedented and they're unfair to our city. I do reiterate five things that I think were very favorable and will have a great impact on New York City. The $15 minimum wage, which we know will be a real fight in Albany, but we will certainly be front and center in that fight. The same with uh, paid family leave would be a great step forward, but it'll be a fight. Uh, the two housing initiatives, the supportive housing and the affordable housing initiative, both very good for the city and the state, and the deepening of the commitment on pre-K. Obviously, New York City is now at full strength. We're glad there's going to be an opportunity for the state to go even farther as well. So those are good things. But we stand ready to fight those cuts to CUNY and those fights, and we stand ready to fight those cuts to Medicaid for sure. On that topic or any other topics, Aaron. Um, you mentioned specifically the CUNY and uh, Medicaid. We understand there may be some other things in the budget that are also going to give the city more costs. Have you figured out what any of those are? And can you also elaborate a little more on your meeting with the governor yesterday? Sure. Did you tell him any of what you just said? Here? Yes. Um, I spoke to the governor yesterday and today. A um, couple things. So our formal response on the budget is in about two weeks. So rather than say to you, you know, we're going to come out with piece by piece, as we get a, a true analysis of the whole budget and the ramifications, we'll give you a, a very formal presentation. That I'll be going up to Albany to do that. Um, I certainly said to the governor the first time I heard uh, the details of his cuts were yesterday, was yesterday. I said that I was very concerned and that I thought it would uh, be very damaging to the people of this city. And that was before I knew that it might, in fact, be a set of cuts that would grow and deepen over the years, particularly on Medicaid. So I reiterated my concern this morning. Uh, there is a legislative process ahead, and I want to recognize that fact. Many, many things go into a budget day one in Albany, and you don't see them by the time the budget is voted on, or you see a very, very different reality. And we've got great allies right here uh, who are going to be part of that. So again, I am hopeful that we can turn back these cuts. Mara. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I guess how, how are you planning on, on turning back those cuts? Are you going to be making calls to legislators? Or are you going to be um, barn stomping? What, what are you going to be doing? There's a phrase from American history, by any means necessary. I would invoke that phrase. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll do whatever will work. And we certainly will turn to the New York City delegation in the Senate and the Assembly, who uh, have proven time and again that they can protect the interests of New York City, both in terms of stopping bad things from happening, but also making sure we get the support we deserve. Yes? About the budget, is that cool? Let's stay on that just okay. first. Go ahead. Mayor, how should New Yorkers interpret these cuts? Do you, do you think that there's a connection between this and the, and the vendetta that you have expressed um, the governor seems to have? which I think is, I think that many New Yorkers feel that he has something out for you personally. So I'm wondering if you can you know, sort of assess how it's all place. Look, I am, uh, I'm going to keep being me. I'm going to keep doing what I believe in. I'm going to do what this city needs. Uh, and I'm going to fight for what this city needs in Albany. And so far, uh, we have a lot to be proud of with the help of our colleagues in Albany. Pre-K is a great example. Uh, there's plenty of other examples of things that we've been able to move forward. Now, we have to be a little careful 
because there were some very good things in that budget, too. So I want to be fair and say I appreciate, I said it yesterday, I'll say it again, I appreciate that the governor included supportive housing and affordable housing in that budget. Those were big changes that were needed for this city and state. So uh, I think we'll see how the whole process plays out. Uh, we're going to make sure that the needs of the people in New York City are fully regarded in that process. That's, that's how I characterize the situation right now. I apologize. Did he give any, any sense as to why uh, he, he cut CUNY and cut Medicaid? Uh, yes, I don't want to overly characterize the conversation, and I think he elaborated a bit this morning on the radio, and I think it's fair to ask him you know, and his team to, to explain that. I understand every chief executive has to make tough decisions, but again, our concern here is these are very big cuts that will affect the health care of the people in New York City, that will affect the ability of our young people to get an education. And there are cuts that could grow and grow over the years and really be debilitating. And it's important to note uh, that, yes, uh, the president has to make tough budget decisions, the governor has to make tough budget decisions, but I can tell you what's different when you're mayor. There's no safety net for the city of New York. When times get tough, and they will, we know enough about economics, and we, we watch with some concern what's happening now with the stock market, with China. When times get tough and the economy goes bad and revenues start plummeting, they plummet at the federal level, they plummet at the state level, they plummet at the city level. When I turn around in today's day and age and say to Washington and say to Albany, we're in trouble now, the cavalry is not coming. Let's be very clear. It's just not. Maybe in 1975, but not anymore. So we have to protect ourselves here in this city. We learned it in a very different way in 2001. One thing I've always said I appreciate about Michael Bloomberg was he understood that we had to protect ourselves after 2001, that we would work with the federal government, we'd work with the state government, we ultimately had to protect ourselves through the NYPD and other means. Well, when it comes to the budget, there's a parallel. I'm not trying to make too uh, inappropriate an analogy, but I think there is some resonance here. When times go bad, the city of New York will be on its own. And the resources we have kept in reserve, we will need all of them. And we have many new challenges we're trying to deal with, which you'll hear about in the next budget presentation for the city coming up. But if the state continues to put on us hundreds of millions of new costs, in fact, ultimately billions of dollars in new costs, that threatens our ability to serve our people, and it would certainly put us in a dangerous fiscal situation. So that's why we have to think differently than folks at the state or federal level would. Dave. Mayor, I guess my, my question is related. I see how these cuts are all going to affect us, the $800 million in Medicaid and also CUNY cuts to New York City residents. But how do you think it personally affects you and what the governor's done? Uh, I don't get lost in the personality issues. Um, again, I am objective enough to say, and I've said this many times, so I'll, I really want to set the stage here. Ed Koch said it, I stole it. When a governor is good to New York State, he should be, I mean, excuse me, when a governor is good to New York City, he should be praised, commended, supported. When a governor does something that's bad for New York City, it's the mayor's job to stand up to it. So here in this budget, there are some things that are very good for New York City, really good for New York City. And there's two things that are not only bad, uh, they change the rules of the game. And they have a multiplier effect that could be very, very dangerous, particularly on Medicaid. So um, I heard a guy once say something about a tale of two cities. Uh, <laughs> this budget has both elements. So I thank the governor for the good elements, and I will fight against the cuts that are unfair to this city. I don't take things personally. I have a job to do. Mayor, a question about mass transit. Yes. While you don't... In the budget you're talking about yeah, still. Well, while you yeah, well, I like that. Wait a minute, wait. Can we stay on budget? Are we staying on budget? Well, it's all related to the MTA budget. And all right, try me. While you don't control the MTA, New Yorkers tend to blame the mayor if things are terrible. And what people in Williamsburg and other parts of Brooklyn are looking at are extended service outages. You may have heard about the plan that 
might potentially shut down the L train for as long as three years between Manhattan and Brooklyn. As mayor, how concerned are you about that for those commuters, and is there anything your office can do, whether it's ferries, instructing the DOT to do things, how concerned are you about what could be a very disruptive community? Look, it is. I'm very concerned. I'm very concerned. Folks who live along the L train already are dealing with overcrowded trains and um, a lack of frequent enough service and a lot of problems. The MTA, controlled by the state of New York, thank you for recognizing that fact. Please report that to your viewers. The MTA, controlled by the state of New York, is responsible for protecting the interests of those riders. And if we feel the state is not protecting the interests of those riders, we will address that very forthrightly. So um, I understand there are some real structural issues that have to be addressed. I don't take that lightly. Um, so we would expect the state to step up, the MTA to step up, and provide us both with a vision of how they're going to address the problem and what they're going to do to provide ample enough transportation for anyone who can't get the train they usually do. We'll help in any way we can, but again, let me just throw down the uh, yellow flag here. We um, have to be clear that the state of New York has to cover its responsibilities. The city of New York is responsible for our responsibilities. There's many, many areas where we are solely responsible. We accept that responsibility, but the state has to own up to its responsibilities. So if the L train is disrupted, the state, the MTA, have to come up with an alternative. We'll work with them in every way we can. We have members on the MTA board who will certainly speak up for the interests of our riders, but we need to hear a plan from the state that will clarify how they handle this disruption. Yes. I may give them a little more. Emily. I understand that the city will fight it with everything it has, but if these cuts in the new cost to the city come to be, how will the city absorb the cost? Will there be cuts to agencies? Or? Well, first of all, we do not intend to let these cuts go through. Um, we've seen many proposals that were defeated in Albany before. Uh, the impact, think about it for a minute. The, it, say the initial dollar figure, and we're still again assessing, but 500, 600, 700 million dollars in the first year, going up to between 1 billion and 1 and a half billion between the two pieces over the next few years. What's losing a billion dollars mean to the city of New York? It means everything we're talking about here in schools would be set back. It means we couldn't do, for, for example, we just are, we're adding 2,000 more cops. We wouldn't be able to do that in the future if we lost a billion dollars from our budget. So it cuts to the heart of what we're doing here, and that's why it is not acceptable to us. In the back. In terms of uh, the state budget, what is your working number on how much you're going to have to fill? And in terms of the surplus, is there a limit on how much you would take from that, or do you not want to touch that? Uh, I'm glad you asked that. I thank you. We, the working number question I'm going to leave to our budget people because, as was indicated earlier, there's more than one thing going on in that budget. I'm talking about two particular cuts that are deeply distressing, but I think it's better for you to hear the whole picture from our budget folks. Uh, and again, we'll be presenting the city budget very shortly uh, on the uh, 21st, so we'll fill in those blanks uh, then in particular. Um, the second part of your question, I'm sorry. Surplus, yes. Uh, again, that's why I, I tried to try to provide a little bit of the history that um, there really is no such thing as a surplus in today's day and age. We have put reserves in place to deal with, for example, the huge amount of uh, health benefits we're responsible for for the long term of our uh, workers and our retirees, but nowhere near the amount that we're obligated to pay. We've put reserves in place so we can uh, do the capital spending we need to for roads, bridges, highways, all the things of schools, new schools, all the things that people are demanding that we need more and more. We have a reserve fund that allows us to do that. We have a general reserve. But in the instance of a recession, which everyone, everyone in this room can visualize a little bit more today than a couple of weeks ago because of what's happening around the world right now. Uh, in the instance of a recession, we would lose several billion dollars in city revenue within a year easily, if not more. We'd lose several billion in state revenue. Four or five billion dollars would be gone in the course of the fiscal year. That would wipe out every reserve we have right now. So that's why it is 
the kind of reserve that is so necessary, it may be necessary to use it all immediately if we went into an economic crisis. That suggests, suggests that in any way his budget was aimed to cut you off at the knees was anti-Italian. Uh, do you believe that is that it would be an anti-Italian suggestion that he is uh, on some sort of? Uh, I haven't heard the tape. I I do understand he was talking to Brian Lehrer, and Brian Lehrer I think is a a fine human being and harbors no bias towards anyone. Okay, I'm going to do these two, and I'm out. Go. Is there any indication that you would have to delay your budget response at all past the 21st? No. Staten Islanders are getting increasingly frustrated with the long delays and commutes that they face because of delay, traffic delays on the Staten Island Expressway. I know you spoke a little bit about this earlier. The mm -hmm. state controls those thoroughfares, but is there anything the city can do? Is this on your radar? Are you concerned at all about one hour delays and people not even being able to get to work on time? Of course. I'm very concerned about it, and you know, I, I, as you know, until two years ago, drove myself along a lot of those same roads, particularly the Gowanus Expressway, for example. And it is a state responsibility. The state has uh, taken some action. We commend them. They did some repaving. They added some HOV lanes. That there were some improvements, but there's more to be done. So we're certainly going to push the state to fix those problems on those roads. People should not have to have a one-hour commute, obviously. I understand the frustration of Staten Islanders who want to know why things aren't working. We have a very aggressive repaving program for our roads, the most repaving that we've, the city's done in many, many years. Clearly, we have to push the state to do the repairs needed as well. Thanks, everyone.